I'd like to bid you welcome to yet another in the policy dialogue series on what's called the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution widely understood to even include the possibility of an oil spill, for example. Um, today, incidentally, is called the Solutions Day at COP27 that's now going on in Egypt. And it is my strong view that today we are dealing with solutions. We are extremely privileged, honored to have among us two, ex two persons, experts, who are at the forefront of the field in the discussion of biofuels, bioenergy, and might I add, the environment. Um, Professor Lee Rybeck Lynn is the Paul E. and Joan H. Quino Distinguished Professor of Engineering at Dartmouth College, and Professor Luis Horta Noguera, who has received the Order of Rio Branco, a high honor, has retired, I believe it was retired, I'm not good at Portuguese, um, <laughs> from the Federal University of Itahuba in Brazil. Gentlemen, Sorry. I'd like to welcome you and to ask you to make any corrections to, um, you know, misstatements on my part, even mispronunciations. <laughs> okay. I bid you welcome you and all the other participants who've been gracious enough to join us this morning, I bid you welcome as well on behalf of the United Nations Guyana, who would normally be here and who have been looking forward to being here, but something actually was scheduled for today. And we decided at any rate that this webinar was far too important for us to postpone it. I convey to you the best greetings and the appreciation of Yeshim Orok, the resident coordinator uh, in Guyana of the United Nations. And I can assure you, and of, of her colleagues as well, I can assure you too that she would be following the, um, the video presentation after. We have a distinguished set of, in addition to you outstanding gentlemen, we also have a distinguished set of participants joining us um, to listen to the presentations on bioenergy and the environment. And we shall move to the we, we shall move to your presentations very shortly. But the sequence will be first, you, Orta, will present some near-term opportunities in bioenergy, especially bringing us. Um, a, a sense of sharing with us a sense of the state of the art applications in Brazil, which has been a leader in biofuels and biofuel technology. I, I suspect based largely in the sugar industry, but you will, you will tell us about that. Let me say at this stage that at yesterday's COP27 meeting, President elect Lula made the comment that. Brazil is back to um, an attempt at a multilateral approach to addressing climate change. And he made a few commitments, one of them being cooperation in technology transfer. I believe that we're talking solutions, and we're also talking about the thing that Professor that um, President elect Lula also made reference to yesterday. Mm -hmm. Finally, before I turn it over to you gentlemen, I'd like to say that today's webinar follows on an exciting one we had yesterday from the WWF uh, um, Peru office, basically, on the living Amazon. And we, we, we actually um, were almost thinking ahead to today's webinar when we listened to the presentation and the discussion yesterday. So you've all been enriching the policy dialogue series. And without much further ado, except to say that at the end of the presentations, which will be first by 
uh, Professor um, Noguera Horta, followed by Professor Lin, who will present on cutting edge frontier scientific um, research on biofuel technology and biofuels. And by the way, Professor Lin is an absolutely um, renowned, a world renowned scientist and leader in the field, but one who is really very conscious if you were to read his, his um, bio even, and I hope you did, very conscious of the role he plays and his science plays in a potential solution to the current climate um, crisis, if you will. Oh, by the way, I'm going to turn my camera a little bit towards my shirt so that I could point out to you that gifted to me here, I think you'll see it in reverse fashion, mirror, the mirror image, is SDG 13, Climate Action. It was gifted to me by um, Will Evans of the local UN office. And as I'm saying, Professor Lind is, is, is very conscious in his work of the role that he is playing. And I assure you that it is he, as one of the leaders in this field, in addressing climate change and proposing a solution. So after the presentations, we will have question and answer, a question and answer session. Or will it be, gentlemen, that you would like to do questions and answers between your presentations? Orta, please. It's okay for me. It's okay. So afterwards, we'll take yes, general yes. Question and, questions and answers from everybody. At which stage, we'll invite you to join the panel um, so that you could participate in a more meaningful way. So welcome, everyone. And in particular, welcome to you, Orta. Welcome, Lee. Thank you for honoring us with your presence and for being so forth, um, forthcoming in your willingness to share your exceptional knowledge with us. Over to you, Orta, first of all. And both of you could share your slides, by the way. Okay. Thank you, Thomas, so much for this uh, really nice opportunity to be with you this morning. Uh, in this, uh, in this webinar to discuss uh, um, relevant uh, technology for you in this moment very interesting for your country where you are opening a new frontier in oil production and very important in global terms but uh, maybe uh, it is could be a source of opportunities to improve renewable energy in your country i believe that so uh, I will share my, my, my presentation. And please let me see. A lot of things here, sorry. If you'd like me to, I could share a presentation. But I would okay. take away some, you do it in order. But it's, it's funny that I included <laughs> I suppose that that is here. Okay, I have one here. Uh, are you? Can you see my screen? We can see your screen, but it is not as bright. I think there's something. Maybe you should click somewhere outside of the presentation. Oh yes. Now it's okay. Um, it's not as bright as the one that you had sent me. Well, would you want to go to the very first slide, please, Orta? Sorry. Uh, well, I am, I am in my screen. I see exactly I prepared for you. No, that's not the one we're seeing, Orta. Well, could you, could you, uh, Yes, I'll do it. You'll have to stop sharing, I suspect. Okay. Very well. And I shall now share the presentation that you sent me. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have just introduced one slide more. I try to be the shortest possible, but 
as you know, bioenergy is, has a long history, is a very broad uh, topic, but I select some slides to introduce you what is going on now, the perspectives, and leave for Lee the forthcoming uh, perspectives and near term uh, development on bioenergy. Uh, the next slide, please. So, yes, uh, the top, I uh, introduced briefly the bioenergy global perspective, then some sites on the sugar cane as a feedstock for the bioenergy then the main aspects of the brazilian experience and prospects and challenges and i have some uh, few slides about the guyana i was visiting guyana three times exactly studying more than 10 years ago but i think that many of these uh data uh, remains valid is still uh, even today. Please, the next one. Uh, I introduced in my <laughs> last, la latest version one slide that is not here. It's about the uh, importance of biofuels in the global uh, context and seeing that in many countries today, blending mandates of bioethanol and diesel it's very common not just in south america where basically all countries is flooding guyana's uh Suriname and guyana and venezuela and chile all those countries are using some level of blending some in the higher level some with low, low, uh, just introducing but we are the continent where bioenergy is very uh, use it. And it is uh, the source of energy that, according to the International Energy Agency, is one of the many, many uh, renewable source of energy. And in some report, the next slide, please. Uh, yes, it's funny that they put sugar cane in the cover of the renewable uh, report a few years ago. The next slide, please. Uh, here you have some forecast about the increase of uh, biofuels use abroad, uh, basically is it and all in the green column, and also some uh, fuels uh, use it for diesel and genes is biodiesel and HVO. Okay, uh, nowadays is about five percent of all energy consumed globally came from uh, photosynthesis, came from bioenergy. And uh, and the, the trend is to grow, to grow up, but it should be uh, accelerated. We need more bioenergy in the, in the uh, global context. The next, please. So some uh, words about sugarcane. Sugarcane is a very efficient plant to collect solar energy, to convert in chemical energy. And it is uh, uh, um, different from other uh, crops used for energy as corn or maize. Uh, Sugarcane is a semi-coronial, semi-perennial crop planted once and harvest uh, in different ratons, as you say. Uh, and it is very interesting because we can uh, share the implementation, the plantation costs in different harvest seasons. So uh, it's very efficient. And about one ton of sugarcane means 1.2 barrels of petroleum. So one hectare of sugarcane produces about 100 barrels of oil per year forever. There is no uh, horizon in terms of using this. We are planting sugarcane in Guyana and Brazil, in the last three centuries at least. So uh, it is really a renewable source of uh, energy. Again, uh, the next one, please. And uh, exactly due to this efficiency in collecting solar energy, for each unit of fossil energy inverted in uh, this agri-industry produces 80 to 10 units of renewable energy 
And in some cases already, uh, there are uh, uh, mills producing 15 to 18 times more energy. So uh, it's uh, very high efficiency uh, is observed in, even in the context where you have intense mechanization and, in, and using a lot of people, a lot of human labor more than other uh, energy technology is an advantage depending on the, the context no uh, I, 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 are you following me in these uh, slides i guess okay thomas because <laughs> this kind of webinar you yes, are we alone are. Yes, you yes, are... We are i know i know what you mean but it is fantastic and we are we see this okay, like because... very, very good. I am alone here in my office with the screen. I don't know if That's you are. Right. <laughs> the next one, you. please. Okay. So uh, the next, uh, yes, it's interesting to to highlight that the sugarcane agroindustry in Brazil and in Colombia and in Guatemala and in Paraguay, for instance, uh, is different from the other countries where sugarcane is used just for sugar production. Here as in other parts, you use baguettes to fuel cogeneration system to produce electricity and heat, but you use essentially the molasses as the liquid uh, string that is, is a byproduct in sugar production and some part of the juice to produce ethanol. So uh, the uh, ethanol production is inserted, is blended in the sugar production. And in the recent years in Brazil, we are using also uh, corn as a feedstock, a corn in combined with or not with. Hello? Can anyone, um, Lee, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So it's a case of Horta's internet probably giving him some trouble. I'd like to ask that we just bear with us, bear with Horta a little bit. But um, as he was saying, this particular slide makes um, is referring to Lee. I should let you do this, um, but it's it, it's depicting the use of baga, um, the use of sugar itself. Sorry. I think Orta's rejoining. Rejoining. There he is. That's right. Horta. Horta. Can you hear us? You may be muted. Yes, no. yes. There we go. Right. So you you're back me. now. You're back now. Yeah. So please continue with this particular slide. Okay. I was just uh commenting that the sugar cane industry in Brazil is different uh, for typically the use of sugar cane to produce just sugar. In Brazil, Guatemala, Colombia, and other countries in South America also are using the sugar cane to produce sugar and in associate to the sugar using the molasses, some part of the sugar cane juice to produce also ethanol. And baguettes is used to produce a lot of power, which is the most important source of renewable energy after hydropower in Brazil is baguettes. Okay. Uh, uh, are you following me? Yes, indeed. Please, uh, the next one. Mm. Next slide, please. So uh, just to, to comment that we have introduced along these uh, last decades, some practices that improved a lot the efficiency and the sustainability in this process. The use of the NAS as fertilizer, the biological control of sugar cane uh, pieces and diseases, and the power generation, as I said, is very important. The use of water was reduced in 20 times. It's very important reduction. So uh, sustainability uh, have been improved in this, in, the, in, the, in this industry. Again, the next slide, please. And uh, it is a synthesis of this improvement of uh, yield and productivity uh, in the agricultural side in the green line and industry in the industry uh, the industry is in blue so the in red is the blend of these two effects 
the high productivity in, in the field, the high productivity in the industry allowed to produce about today more than uh, 7,000 liters of uh, ethanol per hectare. It's a good, a good indicator wow. of the efficiency. With a, a important reduction of costs, you know, uh, it's a consequence of this productivity also. Again, uh, the, the new, the, um, <laughs> the next one, please. And there are frontiers for uh, go on, going on in this process of introducing uh, more efficiency and more sustainability in the process. The use of trash, uh, the tops and leaves in the harvest uh, are used to produce power. The energy cane is a variety of cane with more fiber. It is a reality now in some mills. The second generation, which is more introduced and presented by Lee uh, after me. And the precision agriculture, which is the method, methods to produce, to introduce fertilizers and agrochemicals in the proper uh, needs according to uh, using GIS systems. And biogas production from stillage, from Vinas is a very uh, spreadly, uh, spreadly used nowadays in Brazil. It's very interesting opportunity to increase the energy efficiency in the, the, this industry. Again, uh, the next, please. Uh, here uh, we have a synthesis of the uh, carbon, mitigate, carbon emission mitigation associated with ethanol. Uh, the, the first block of uh, production, we have a, a, the emission that is observed in the uh, production of ethanol. So there are emissions in the planting, the, the, the industry, then uh, more than six tons of CO2 is uh, emitted in this phase using diesel, using uh, different uh, materials. It is a, a, a life cycle analysis, a result of life, life cycle analysis. And in the middle, we will observe that a half, a ton and half uh, of uh, CO2 is emitted for every thousand liters of ethanol. But it is very important, 7.5 uh, tons of CO2 is absorbed during the photosynthesis process to produce the feedstock to be processed to produce exactly a thousand liters of ethanol. So the net effect of this is, is below. Uh, every uh, uh, amount of gasoline with, with the same amount of energy emits more than 3,000 uh, kilograms of CO2, but uh, ethanol emits less than, uh, uh, less than uh, about 10% of this. So it's an important mitigation effect. Next one, please. Here we have interesting uh, perspective of the evolution of the bioenergy use in Brazil. Here we have in the 70s, the, this first, that is the 70s, the consumption of bioenergy in, re, in households, in the transport, sorry, it is in Portuguese though, and industry. And the use of bio, uh, bioenergy in Brazil in that time, in the 70s was uh, 60 um, million of taps. But next, please, uh, we have the, the, the next picture. We have uh, an evidence of you have a, a kind of shifting, reducing the bioenergy consumption in the households and introduce a lot of bioenergy in the transport sector and industrial sector and increasing uh, significantly uh, the amount of bioenergy bio in Brazil, uh, it's missing the, the data. It is 2010 20, uh, about uh, 15 years, uh, this large transition and important transitions towards more use of bioenergy in, in more efficient process. Again, the next. And so we have here a synthesis of these. Though. Uh, our energy metrics uh, nowadays has about 43% based on the renewable sources of energy, and mainly coming from bioenergy in the industrial and in transport and the electricity production also. Next one, please. And here you have a, a, a 
synthesis of our history, introducing ethanol uh, in the 30s, about 100 years ago, more recently introduced by diesel. And now all Brazilian vehicles use biofuels blend in ethanol or diesel uh, engines. Again, the next one, please. So uh, in all Brazilian gas stations, you find just fuels with biofuels. Gasoline nowadays is E27, regular or super. And we have also pure hydrozethanol used in these vehicles, able to burn uh, just ethanol, not gasoline, and biodiesel blends also. Next one, please. And here have some numbers about our fleet. We have 38 million cars, uh, motorbikes, and light butter vehicles and trucks and buses. Next, uh, please. And you have here these in, in this uh, blue box are the auto cycle engines are using gasoline or ethanol. And the next one, please. Okay. And you have these uh, in red one, the vehicles that are using diesel and biodiesel. So uh, is to insist. Okay, the next one, please. Uh, it, here you have an, another uh, synthesis of the main numbers of the, the importance of biofuels in Brazil, the number of units, the amount that they were producing now. I will leave this presentation for you. The next one, please. So uh, just the next, please. Uh, who, okay. Uh, just to mention that in recent years, we introduced in Brazil a carbon tax, a scheme of carbon uh, tax uh, associated to the Brazilian targets to reduce our carbon emissions. I believe that is very interesting scheme that could be considered for other countries and we have uh, interesting numbers. I have no time to, to go deep on this, just to mention to be you aware about uh, this. The next one, please. Uh, some main reasons to introduce uh, more bioenergy in our countries, tropical countries. Sugarcane is very well known, good yield. There are good examples to be considered, not just in South America, but also in Africa. Uh, there are a lot of land for this. Uh, and sugarcane is very important, can improve social conditions, the generation of stable jobs and improving food, food security. Next one, please. Uh, some observe some comments about the use of ethanol as fuel for cooking in stoves, reducing the use of fuel that is very common in our countries and introduce ethanol uh, has been uh, shown that is very uh, good for health of the people and it is very competitive in many conditions. Next one, please. Uh, it's about the, 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 job, the jobs here in blue. It's a description of the impact that was evaluated for uh, Mozambique, where there is a, a good a perspective for bioenergy, as in other uh, countries in a, a, a sub-Saharan area. The next slide, please. So maybe many of, uh, of you are considering, but this bioenergy production will create problems with food. It's a permanent discussion and a, a mistaken discussion. There, in fact, there is not this clear relationship between introducing more bioenergy and reducing fuel supply. It's not true. There are a lot of data supporting uh, the opportunity for introducing. The next one, please. Here you have an interesting example. The Brazilian uh, beef production is very important uh, in terms of volume and productivity. You are exporting a lot of meat. But see, in the green line is the area of pastures that you are using. And in red is the production of protein in Brazil. So the, the increase of productivity, the pasture intensification, uh, it's very uh, uh, in favor of opening large areas without uh, in affecting the forest, the 
the, the diversity. Just few percents of the pasture areas could produce a lot of bioenergy in many tropical countries. We have evaluated and have been is today is to have that in many situations. Uh, next one, please. So it is the statement of the FAO that we have to move from the food versus fuel debate to a debate of on food and fuel. It's clear now. The next one, please. And we have an interesting perspective in terms of new technologies to uh, adopt uh, uh, biofuels. In fact, electrical vehicles run better when using biofuels. Uh, this Toyota Corolla hybrid model, it's available in Brazil uh, dealers, uh, pre uh, present the lowest emission of CO2 per kilometer compared with any other cars because it has efficiency and are using a fuel with a very small carbon footprint. Next one, please. So the main messages are uh, that the biofuels is very effective to reduce carbon emissions in poor air qualities right now. Hello. The technology is already available. The conventional process Lee, you will introduce the, not, the new frontiers, but you have now uh, already conditions to introduce that. And this production's potential is very large and could bring a relevant socioeconomic benefits, as I said, in terms of employment, income generation uh, soon. Next, please. I put here few slides about the previous I, I i did this study in 2007 and uh in that time it was a it's what already clear there was no discoveries of oil offshore air in guyana and it, it was a concern about the use of the potential of sugarcane in this region there are in terms of uh, recuperation of the capacity of the sugar mills. And it, I was convinced that uh, it's an opportunity. The next one, please. After this study, uh, also in United Nations, a CLAC, the uh, Economic Commission of Latin America and the Caribbean, produced a very interesting study about the feasibility of ethanol distilleries in Guyana, a very, very detailed study. And uh, interesting that some mention of ethanol is presented in the uh, study of at how Guyana could uh, pledge to reduce its uh, emission, uh, a very hot topic in these days. No? The next one, please. I have some numbers about in that time when I was visiting Guyana, the impressive numbers of the importance of sugarcane in this country, the area, the number of jobs, the amount, the productivity number is, the, the yield is, is is rational, is, is okay, and the opportunity to produce uh, bioenergy in the context of reducing the market of sugar. Okay, the next one, please. Uh, uh, it, it is my last slide. Uh, I was uh, very impressed with this number, this, this picture. Please pay attention. I think that it's clear that bioenergy is an option of choice for our countries, wet tropical countries. But this graph, my friends, is for Finland, <laughs> the Santa Claus land, a very, uh, very cool area. And they decided in the 70s to reduce the oil and introduce more bioenergy. In this case of them, there is no sugar cane, but they have trees. But a tree there takes more than 20 years to grow. Instead here is, in my country, six years. I believe that is the same numbers, the most productive species. But it's funny to observe that now a country in the Scandinavia are using more bioenergy than oil. It's a shame for us. Why, what, why not us? OK? Let to produce oil, to export, to make money, and to increase the sustainability of the energy system in our countries. Okay, 
it's a kind of provoca provocative <laughs> slide, but I was impressed with that. Why Finland is a front of his front runner in bioenergy? Why not us? No? The next one, please. I think this is the last slide. Okay. We have some books, some papers. Lee had a lot of interesting works on that. I, I am glad to pass to him now. Sorry to be so long. I intended to be shortest, but sorry. Thanks. Um, Horta, actually, um, Lee is asking that we continue with your discussion a little bit, maybe having some questions and answers, and Lee will rejoin shortly. But he's okay. addressing an issue. I, I, I want. I am uh, I am ready. Very well then. So are there, is there anything else? Let me just um what I can do is stop sharing so that people can have okay. an opportunity to join. Um mm -hmm. we, 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 we... it's it's a challenge, Thomas, to put so many formations. Uh, but uh, sorry for my English and mm -hmm. sorry for it is you... fine. It is fine. And your last slide, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone else, your last slide poses the issue very well for us, that we have the opportunities with, with the kind of um, biomass that we have available. We also have Brazil as a front runner in the development of the technology. And so it is an, a, a paradox, is it not? That Finland is the front runner. Um, Ulrich Trox is going to ask a question right now. Ulrich, I will or make a comment. I'm going to promote you um, so that you can do so. And our minds are with Lee as he responds to his emergency, by the way. Mm -hmm. Ulrich, I've tried to promote you. And let me see now. Well, anyway, uh, I'll at least give you. Um, where is Ulrich Trox? So, everybody, um, Ulrich Trox followed by Richard Blair, please. It, it seems that two participants are rising. Yes, 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 yes. All right, please. I'm going to try to promote you. But at any rate, I'm allowing you to talk. Hello. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Yes, please. Good morning. Please continue. Good morning. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you for that presentation. Uh, indeed, uh, somehow the other biofuels seem to have fallen off of the horizon when we discuss transition to zero carbon. And I'm quite delighted to hear that the concept is alive and well in my neighboring Brazil. Uh, I worked in the 70s, I'm a senior citizen. And in fact, we did a lot of work with Brazil, trying to learn from Brazilian experience on, on biofuels. <clears throat> uh, the alcohol issue right now, I think uh, you would know that Guyana is faced with a challenge about uh, the survival of the sugar industry. What I haven't seen in the local discussion, and Thomas, I don't know how uh, this can be reintroduced as a priority is looking at the sugar industry as an energy industry, uh, basically where sugar is uh, a byproduct and energy is the main focus. I don't know if that concept is still valid. Listening to you this morning, uh, I think there is a lot to be said about uh, pursuing that line line of thought. Uh, you, right. you did mention, mm. No, I was about to say all right. Um, that is precisely what we want to achieve right now. And what I will do as, uh, you know, in, in thanking you for making that contribution, I want to ask that we pause now and allow Lee to make his presentation. Richard, you as well, and everybody else who was 
um, ready to you know contribute to the discussion. Can you allow us to move back to Professor Lim? Sure, now sure. Okay, so yeah. and then we'll come to the discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah. Professor Lin Lee, I now invite you to make your presentation and I hand the floor over to you. Can you hear us? Yes. Right. Okay. Well, I am honored to participate and to meet you all and also to follow my good friend Orta from whom I've learned a lot over the years. Uh, so, uh, can you see the presentation, my friends? Yes, yes. you could. Lee, might I, might I just ask you if you really are really ready to and able to do the presentation? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I think because so. If you aren't, because if you aren't, you know, we will understand. No, thank you. Let's let's get started. Thank, um, you. thank you so much. So is this bar up here on the upper right hand corner in the way or do you not see that? Here, let me get. Uh, you could, you've got to um, change the view on your screen, I think. But we could see, we could see your presentation very well. I um, but you're muted, I think, Lee. And Here we go. So um, can you hear me now? Yes, we could. Then we could see the presentation as well. Very good. Thank you. So I don't know if you heard me say, but I'm honored to be with you and to follow my friend Orta. Uh, Thomas originally contacted me because of an article I wrote on cellulosic biofuels. And I think that there is a bright future for cellulosic biofuels. But I recommended that we hear from Orta first because I think the opportunities I'm talking about require uh, research to realize, and there are many, many opportunities that don't require research to realize, and Orta is an expert on those, especially in developing countries, so I thought we should start there. So as shown in the cartoon in the bottom, I'm going to talk about a high beam perspective, and forgive me, I'm going to go through these things a little bit quickly, but that's so that we have a little bit of time to discuss. So. As you know, the world is changing fast, whether we're looking at, at carbon dioxide or oil consumption or population. And this is enabled, has been enabled by a succession of technological revolutions, the Neolithic, the industrial and the information. But today we need to think about a sustainability revolution that will drive and require continued rapid change in response to two things, the shift to reliance on sustainable resources and processes, but also the fact that in our rich world, most people are still poor. 70% of the world lives on $10 a day or less. And we must solve these in a compatible way and not solve the first one at the expense of the second. So I'm going to talk about biomass energy and cellulose biofuel converse, cellulosic biofuel conversion technology relatively briefly. Um, and so I want to start about the potential for rural economic development, which is Orta has already mentioned, and that biomass energy has a very central role in a sustainable future. And I want to particularly talk about negative emissions from biofuels. So this is a slide uh, developed by um, uh, uh, our friend uh, Angela Marais in uh, Brazil. Uh, excuse me, Marcia uh, Azania Marais in Brazil. I'm thinking of someone else. But if you look at the uh, sustainable development goals, a remarkable quantity of them have potential to be positively impacted for biomass. And so in Brazil, this is the um, largest sugarcane and ethanol is the largest sector 
uh, in, uh, part of the ag sector in terms of employment. There's higher wages, education, and mobility for these workers compared to the average for agriculture and higher for children and their parents and higher tax revenue, more investment in education and social services in communities after an ethanol plant than before, and with an ethanol plant than comparable communities without an ethanol plant. And that's there's quite a bit of data on that. So biofuels are actually needed as part of a low carbon energy future. This was a paper published by the former two-time lead transportation analyst at the International Energy Agency, Lou Fulton. And so you can look at the two degree scenario of the IEA out through 2075. And you can look at many different um, uh, transportation modes. And if you roll all of that together, you find that even out to 2075, about half of global transportation, according to this scenario, is met by biofuels. And that little diamond there, the, the diamond is the total allowable emissions compatible with a two degree scenario. So that basically, even if the rest of the economy is 100% decarbonized, if we don't do this difficult to decarbonize part of transportation, uh, we will not get there. So from that article, we wrote, even with aggressive reductions in, let me see if I can, in travel growth, shifts to mass transport modes, strong efficiency improvements and deep market penetration by vehicles running on electricity and hydrogen, there remains a large demand for dense liquid fuels in 2050, 80% of transport demand, and even 2075. This demand is due largely to aviation, ocean shipping, and long haul trucking. So, let's see if I can move forward, there we go. And just a simple idea, if, we can look at a priorities for biomass based on whether we have alternatives. So we have no sustainable or unsustainable alternatives for food. For liquid transport, biomass is the only source of sustainable liquid fuels, which is a large demand. It's also a leading source for high temperature heat and for industrial materials. But comparably speaking, industrial materials are small. And we, when we get down to electricity, we've got many, many other ways to make electricity. Now, of course, as the Brazilian example has shown, uh, bioenergy uh, from sugarcane gives both liquid fuel and electricity, so it doesn't have to be either or. But in general, transport fuels are a very high priority to do with, to use our biomass resource for. And so here we have the carbon cycle. Um, I'm worried that this is in the way. But the basic idea here is that we can um, avoid emissions by tapping into the carbon cycle. But in addition, we can store carbon dioxide that is made available at these stationary conversion facilities. And so if you look at the Shell net zero scenario, you see that bio biomass, shoot, hold on that biomass energy uh, is equal to coal, oil, and gas combined. If you look at the IPCC's median scenario for 1.5 degrees for 2050, we see, and this surprises many people, we see that the primary energy from biomass is greater than wind and solar combined. Now that includes biomass for electricity and fuel. Um, and then if we look at a, uh, so this is the main reason for this is this idea of negative emissions. Oh, there, let me get rid of that thing. Hold on a minute. That is, if we're going to stabilize uh, climate, we have to not only invoke uh, net uh, zero technologies, but we actually need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So here's a 2021 report by McKinsey saying that substantial negative emissions, that is carbon removals, are needed with emission reductions to avoid catastrophic climate change. Whoops, hold on. And here's just a bunch of scenarios where from the red being very high temperature to the blue being very cool temperature, and if you look at the fraction of bioenergy with carbon captured and, and storage all the way out to 2100, 
on if for these low carbon scenarios on the order of 20 percent of global energy would need to be provided uh, by bioenergy with carbon capture and storage what's not realized uh, by many people is that the, the notion is that many folks are kind of like well you know carbon capture and storage that might all be very good but um the carbon from biofuels is coming out of a vehicle and that's not capturable in the tailpipe now the not capturable in the tailpipe is true but what's not realized is that even for rather efficient biofuel production processes most of the carbon emissions are at the source of production and therefore capturable so here we look at at uh two different uh, ethanol options, and then four different thermochemical fuel options. 60 to 80% of the feedstock carbon is emitted from the biorefinery and thus capturable, even though for the same processes, 40 to 64% of that energy is converted to high value energy uh, carriers. Basically what these processes are doing is concentrating um, the energy onto less of the carbon uh, so most of the half or more of the energy goes to a vehicle, but most of the carbon is capturable. I think this will be a major driver of this field going forward. So we've got to figure out though, if uh, cellulosic biofuels are, are so promising, uh, what is the state of technology uh, and how do we make this happen? So, the last decade was actually, I want to acknowledge, quite disappointing for cellulosic biofuels. Um, so here is in the United States, the million gallons of gasoline equivalent. And if you take out biogas, um, it turns out that just ethanol fell short of our target in the United States by about three orders of magnitude. This is a log scale. In the same period of time, wind and photovoltaics grossly exceeded expectations investment in biofuels both first and second generation has declined compared to what it was uh, 15 years ago and this is another indication of that so if you're going to look at the cellulosic biofuel field you have to acknowledge that there have been some uh, difficult times over the last decade and expectations have not been met and the process that was pursued during that time uh, involved thermochemical pretreatment and added fungal cellulase. And these plants are all very expensive. And indeed, the annualized cost of capital is greater than the ethanol selling price, even with oil at $100 a barrel. And many companies have paused or just abandoned their efforts, including Beta Renewables, Avangoa, DuPont, and Poet DSM. One company has not. And that company is Hyazen in Brazil. So Hyazen is moving forward with cellulosic ethanol when most others are not. And the primary reason is because when you harvest sugarcane, you already bring the cellulosic biomass to the processing facility. And that means you have established pre-existing feedstock supply chains. You don't have that for corn stover, for example, and hence lower cost. And so here is a press release from Hyazen, which includes a public commitment to build two new commercial cellulosic ethanol plants per year for the next 20 years. So many of us have been waiting a long time for this train to pull out of the station. And that appears to be happening now with Hyazen playing a global leadership role. Uh, I will predict that the current processing paradigm will enable the launch of a cellulosic biofuel industry based on co-located plants processing sugarcane in Brazil, but will remain too costly for standalone second generation biofuel production and for most other feedstocks and I believe that a 2G 2.0 processing paradigm with potential for lower costs are of interest in any case. I mean, we hope the current technology does as well as it can, but we see potential for lower cost technology going forward. And Hyazen is very interested in this too. Uh, one has to think about both the next steps and also look down the road. And I'll be talking about consolidated bio, just a little bit about this thing. This is not a technical talk, but I'm very involved, including in an entrepreneurial sense with consolidated bioprocessing with co-treatment. So it's one of these paradigms that could save a, a great deal of uh, money and produce cellulosic biofuels at lower cost. 
So the first observation, technologically speaking, is that the purchase cost of most cellulosic feedstocks is lower than petroleum. And so you can look on a dollar per gigajoule basis. So you can look at the gas, for example, it's on the order of two to four dollars uh, per gigajoule. Well, two to four dollars per gigajoule corresponds to about 10 to 20 dollars per barrel of uh, petroleum. So high processing costs, not the cost of feedstock, is the, are the key barriers to overcome. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, there's pretreatment, there's biological conversion, there's product recovery, and then perhaps catalytic, catalytic conversion afterwards. This figure actually comes from a recent review, if you're interested, but I want to go uh, quickly. Excuse me a second, I need to uh, attend to this. I am sorry. That's Noah, can I call you back fine. soon? Half an hour. Thank you. Excuse Thank you. me. Um, you. And so, just to keep going, you know, the alternative uh, that we're looking at avoids the two parts of the current process that make it expensive the heating and, and or adding chemicals to the biomass and the addition of enzymes. And the cost reduction potential is staggering. Uh, here we're looking at the payback time as a function of scale. This is from a study done with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory who has pioneered the conventional approach. And as you can see, the payback period is about eightfold shorter, eightfold, almost an order of magnitude uh, for the blue which is the new alternative compared to where we are now. Take this as an indication of the potential for research-driven cost reductions and also economic feasibility at tenfold smaller scale compared to the conventional paradigm. But I don't want to, I don't want to imply this is all in hand. This requires development to realize the assumed performance. So great potential, but we have to work to get there. And so finally, I want to talk about ethanol as a key target and enabling intermediate. We did a big study also in that review I mentioned of the highest uh, yield of processes, products produced biologically and the highest concentration. And it's striking that there's only seven anaerobic products, which it has to be to be a fuel. You don't want to be adding oxygen because then you're just oxidizing and losing energy. So of the anaerobic products that are more reduced than glucose, which also is a requirement for a fuel, at least one, uh, there are seven that have at least one of the following desired features, high reported yield, high, higher titer, and boiling point less than water. All of these are small molecules. They have four carbons or less. Small molecules are less expensive to produce biologically than large molecules, especially anaerobically, and especially from lignocellulose. See the review for the details. And so only one compound has all of those features, ethanol. Furthermore, ethanol is in a class by itself when it comes to the ease of recovery compared to these other biological products. So we wrote in this review, ethanol occupies a single space, singular space in the bioproduct landscape. It's the lowest cost liquid fuel or fuel intermediate produced biologically today and is in our view likely to remain so. But, Let's be very clear, this is quite important in my view. And that is that technology for converting ethanol to hydrocarbons is rapidly being developed, which basically means once you can make ethanol at low cost, you can make hydrocarbon fuels at low cost, which are compatible with the most difficult to electrify parts of transportation. So here's a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences about uh, technology development and cost reduction uh, for this type of technology. But I think the most powerful testimony to this is these are all announcements in 22, uh, 2022. These are all announcements of ethanol to sustainable aviation fuel uh, projects, four different projects around the world. Uh, and so essentially, this is what we refer to as hybrid processing, where fermentation uh, converts lignocellulose into uh, intermediates, in this case, uh, ethanol, and then catalytic upgrading makes hydrocarbon fuels. And if you're going to start with cellulose, the first step is the limiting step. 
So this is my last slide. Uh, my take home messages, which I mentioned at the beginning, biomass energy has great potential for rural economic development. Uh, it has a key role in a sustainable future, meeting multiple uh, sustainable development goals. And, I and negative emissions from biofuels are a very important feature. For cellulosic biofuel conversion technology, it is now emerging after a long gestation period. Sugarcane is proving to be the most advantageous point of entry. The technology, however, is still immature with large research-driven cost reductions anticipated. So I'm going to predict that, first of all, the negative emission potential of biofuels will become recognized and will drive deployment. For cellulosic biofuels, sugarcane feedstocks will be the initial proving ground, and new processing paradigms with lower costs will enable additional feedstocks and geographies. And ethanol will be a key intermediate for the production of high molecular weight fuels. Thank you very much. Again, I'm honored to participate, and I will be, I will stop sharing my screen and be more than happy to take questions.